This is the first time uh, at a HCA meeting where we've had a session on the development atlas or atlases. And what I'm going to go through is to uh, talk about the efforts that are ongoing within the community and also uh, vignettes of some of the work that we've been doing um, in the United Kingdom. So I thought I'd start off uh, with a quote really from uh, the famous developmental biologist Lewis Wolpert who basically said that it's not birth, marriage or death, but in fact gastrulation, which is truly the most important time, but I think we could probably extend gastrulation to include development before birth, which is a much bigger uh, time frame than gastrulation. So I think this is going to be a very important and exciting initiative, and I hope to convince you by the end of it how it's going to be truly transformative. These are big questions, really kind of going back to the very bare essence of what really, you know, how we grow and how we age. Uh, about health and also really developmental pathways that are either exploited or become aberrant during a lot of disease processes, and a classic example of this being cancer. It also is extremely important in the context of stem cell and regenerative medicine, and I'll highlight a little bit later on. Uh, in terms of the stem cell sort of um, technologies, you've got you know iPSCs, inducible pluripotent stem cells, and you know what is the benchmark for for this form of uh, uh, in vitro generated cells? You know what do we know about the primary cells in vivo? So I'm going to talk a little bit about the different initiatives that are ongoing around the world. Uh, and starting off with the uh, work that's being done in Sweden. This is a Swedish consortium. Um, and the principal investigators here are listed here, led by Joachim Lundberg, Stanley Narsen, Emma Lundberg, Eric Sundström, and Mats Nilsson. And the main focus of the Swedish effort is into looking at the developing brain, the uh, developing heart, and also the developing lung. And why do we need to understand this? It's very obvious. If you look at in terms of the brain, you've got neurodegenerative um, diseases that you know, we will have an, a handle on by understanding how the brain develops. Uh, and we know very well a lot of the work where, you know, including immune cells that are pervasive, but uh, in, in the brain that are important. But this is going to be much more focused on the actual um, uh, cortical cells themselves. And then looking at you know, understanding lung cancer, what can we understand about lung development? And there was a very interesting talk at the stem cell, a single cell biology meeting that, that has just finished, and whereby Dana Peer presented some data looking at how during uh, lung uh, carcinoma, there is you know, exploitation of developmental pathways that really was leading to uh, carcinogenesis and metastasis. And, and you know, obviously with heart disease, being one of the kind of commonest uh, causes of um, ill health in, in the developing world. What can we understand about how the heart develops and whether we can actually develop regenerative uh, targets in situ? And at the moment, there's always this idea that we, well, there's evidence that we can actually expand uh, stem cells in culture, but there isn't actually a directed, targeted way of expanding them in vivo, which would be truly revolutionary. So the second initiative that's ongoing is that led by Arnold Krigstein in um, UCSF, and this is uh, looking at the developing brain, which is funded by the NIH. Um, and this is looking at uh, two types of approaches, really. One is looking at the single cell transcriptome, both whole cell and also nuclear sequencing to uh, establish a census of the uh, cortical cells uh, in the developing uh, brain and to couple this with electrophysiological studies, um, primarily calcium signaling, and to then have an integrated way of uh, classifying cells uh, in the brain using this approach. Um, and this is the current status of that project, uh, how many cells that have been sequenced uh, with uh, single cell RNA sequencing, um, and also the number of cells using uh, nuclear sequencing and the number of cells where both the transcriptome analysis has been integrated with electrophysiological studies at 600. So what about the UK development atlas? I think we're extremely lucky here, um, partly because Sarah wakes up at four in the morning <laughs> to, to actually think about what to do. So I think that's a, um, a great benefit for us. 
Exactly. So we have a full 24-hour shift, you see, if you've got somebody who goes to bed late. But anyway, um, but, but, but really, our, our luck is, is because we have an extremely fantastic resource in the UK, the Human Developmental Biology Resource. And, and this is a, a resource that's been a, a tissue bank, really, which has been going on um, for the last 18 years, funded jointly by Wellcome and MRC. And this has got the clinical input from the hospital staff, not just the consultants who are involved in the um, clinical management, but also research midwives who are uh, there to um, consent patients uh, subsequent to their hospital visit and whereby those uh, who consent for the uh, sample to be donated, the tissue is then collected, taken to the um, laboratory, the HDBR laboratory, whereby tissues are processed and um, dispatched. And this then goes back uh, to, the, to the researchers who use it for their research and subsequently any data that comes out of it goes back to the HDBR database and also in the form of publication. Now interestingly, um, as I was talking to Apana Baduri who was leading the um, uh, developing brain project uh, in Arnold uh, Crixton's lab, the first trimester samples for that project has actually come from Newcastle. So this is um, just to show the potential for this uh, resource to be used um, more widely. Now, HDBR project pro provides a tissue resource for a wide number of projects, not just in the UK, as I have alluded to earlier. And there are different forms of uh, tissue that one can get. You can either get whole tissues or cells, and also sections on slides, um, RNA, DNA, or protein. And this includes specimens uh, or samples from three to 20 post-conception weeks. And you know, there can be specific processing that's requested and then also transport to the, to the uh, researchers, which is basically customized collection for project. So this is just to show some of the things that HDBR is doing, uh, which you, know, you can have um, these type of services within HDBR, either in situ hybridization, immunohistochemistry, chemistry and gene expression, but also things that are more bespoke that are done by the researchers. Um, and it's based both in Newcastle and also in UCL in London. And we've got Susan Lindsay here, who's the director of the HDBR in Newcastle, uh, in the audience with us. And this is to show you the number of um, samples. This is plotted over 2016 and 2017. So just looking at the number of quarters, and this is the post-conception weeks. Uh, and, um, and on average, you can get about 60 samples, or 60 samples have been collected for the use of researchers worldwide every quarter. And, and one of the prerequisite of, of this resource is that data must be uh, made open and publicly accessible, and that includes nucleic acid data. So the UK effort has been a collaborative effort. We've partnered with um, HDBR and also um, where I'm based in Newcastle and uh, also uh, with Sanger and really establishing a pipeline direct from getting the sample uh, all the way down and to the um, data coordination portal of the Human Cell Atlas. So I'm going to basically uh, present uh, some of the kind of work that we've done. And so what we've looked at is not just fetal tissues, but also tissues from the fetal maternal interface. Um, and so far, we've analyzed uh, approximately 260,000 cells. Uh, and I'm going to focus on kidney uh, and also placenta and decidua. And the first vignette will be with regards to nephron development or kidney development. Uh, in more general, uh, and in the context of how has this uh, informed us about the pathogenesis of Wilms tumor, a common pediatric cancer that affects the kidney. So this is work in, done in, uh, led by Sam Bajati. So looking at single cell RNA transcriptome uh, of, of all kidney cells, we were able to basically identify the developmental pathway of uh, nephrons and essentially working out the stages from the ureteric bud, capillary mesenchyme, and the primitive vesicle. And if you actually look at this um, trajectory analysis, you can work out all of the different transcription factors that are involved in, in nephron development. And we've highlighted here 
those that are known and all of the others that are not highlighted are the new insights that we've gained in terms of transcription factors and, and path genes that are involved in, in nephron development. And you'll notice here, this gene here, WT1, is also the gene that's um, commonly um, abnormal in, in, in Wilms tumor. So what we can then do by sequencing uh, Wilms tumor and looking at the transcriptome profile of Wilms tumor, ask the question, at what stage of uh, nephron development does Wilms tumor recapitulate or otherwise? It's been widely assumed that this pediatric tumor is actually uh, a form of uh, primitive uh, nephrogenesis that kind of doesn't go to the uh, full um, extreme to become a nephron. So it's a bit of a form thrust development. And so we can, and can plot here and, can, and, and confirm that transcriptionally, Wilms tumor cells, which are these black dots and um, circles, basically occupy uh, the same transcription uh, parameter space as that of the uh, developing cells forming the nephron. Now, how might this be important? Well, this tells us that perhaps instead of focusing on cytotoxic therapies which essentially destroy cells and probably are fairly indiscriminate uh, and giving a lot of side effects, ways that we can actually target the differentiation of uh, kidneys might be a way of um, treating Wilms tumor. And also identifying how the kidney develops will provide us with insights into how we can manipulate uh, uh, or in regeneration in situ uh, of kidney development. Um, the second is with regards to the fertile maternal interface, uh, and this is uh, looking at the deciduum placenta, and um, Aviv showed earlier on uh, the, some of the kind of highlights of it. This work is led by Rosa, uh, Rosa Vento Tome, who is in the audience, along with Miriana uh, uh, in uh, Sarah's lab, um, and essentially uh, in, in this effort, it's actually a, a very nice collaborative effort whereby there's been exchange of visits where we have uh, Rosa coming over to Newcastle and also working in uh, Sanger at the same time. So um, this is looking at uh, this sort of um, cellular analysis of the fetal maternal interface and in terms of trying to understand what is the structure that is mediating this immunological tolerance that's critical for fetal survival and growth. And what's known, and as we've alluded to earlier, there is the allogeneic sort of cells. Basically, you've got the maternal cells and the fetal cells, and somehow they all need to exist in a happy medium. But there must be also modulation of that interface that will allow the, the fetus to survive in terms of um, getting nutrients and oxygenation and so on and so forth. Um, and so looking at the transcriptome profile, we can actually identify all of the different cell clusters. And because we had the maternal um, DNA and also maternal peripheral blood, we could actually work out which cells were maternally derived and you know, derived from the fetus to try and really understand these interactions. And, and knowing this, you can actually reconstruct a, a kind of a, a structure and, and look at how that structure is being modeled uh, during the first trimester uh, pregnancy. So what this tells us is, you know, how, what is the functional organization of this interface that allows for a successful pregnancy? And by gaining this insight, we will be able to understand what then may be causing loss of pregnancy or retarding uh, fetal growth. But at the molecular level, it tells you the different cell states that are involved in this process and cell circuitry that are fundamental, uh, fundamental for this. Now, you've heard a lot about UK Brexit, but Brexit has not stopped us from forging ahead and making alliances across the English Channel. So we now collaborate with um, Alain Chadatal, uh, who is based in Paris, in INSEM, and trying to basically map this analysis that we've done at cellular suspension level uh, in a spatial context. Now, Alain ch chose this video, uh, and you can see how these images will really be able to transform uh, the, um, the understanding that we can gain from uh, single cell, uh, cell suspension analysis. 
So these images are actually available online, uh, and um, uh, and you will be able to see in the credits um, where you can get the images. And they are not just about the developing sort of um, vascular system in the in the uh, during development, but also. Uh, all of the other organs, such as gut, lung, and heart. But it also tells us, and uh, you know, or highlights at this point, the challenges in terms of integrating the data sets and also uh, computational analysis of, of these sort of data sets. So I don't have a computer to actually um, regulate these, but I think that's uh, okay. So some of the uh, biological challenges, I think, in, in studying development is obviously the issue of space and time, I mean, which is significantly distorted because half a day during development is extremely different to half a day in, in, in sort of postnatal or adult life. And there are so many unknown unknowns with minimal coordinates to navigate by in terms of orienteering us to what are the cells that are there. Canonical markers that we think are relevant and applicable in the adult may not be relevant during development. And what we have are essentially a series of snapshots by stages. And somehow we need to be able to make these snapshots into a sort of a, a video uh, time frame reel. So, and there are also um, logistical challenges uh, in terms of coordinating the different projects within the um, Development Atlas and the HCA, uh, integrating the different platforms that researchers will be using. Uh, we saw there using nuclear sequencing and uh, whole cell sequencing and imaging. You know, how do we tackle these problems? And also concrete funding uh, for these projects, which are extremely expensive in terms of data deposition and also data release, some of these issues that we need to um, think about. Um, I'm going to finish here by um, highlighting how, uh, an, a spotlight article that we recently um, published in the journal Development. Um, and really, this article is trying to focus on how, uh, you know, what can we get out of the development atlas? How will it benefit the scientific and the clinical communities to advance our understanding of basic biology, health, and disease, and how we can work together with the developmental biology community uh, uh, around? So this is new, um, and uh, just to quote Banksy, if there is no way, we shall create one. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Buzz. Thank you, Buzz. Um, so we've got time for a couple of questions. If you'd like to speak, please do ask your question into a microphone. Can you, can you explain more on how the DISCO, iDISCO, whatever it's called, amazing process works? Like, what do you need to actually do these visualizations? Ah, OK. So uh, Alan is here, but Maybe it's, uh, Alan can. Yeah, he's there. So it's tissue clearing with light sheet microscopy, but I'll let him explain in great detail. Uh, so just briefly, we, we, you just use solvents to remove lipids from tissue. You just left with uh, fixed proteins, and then that's it. So and then you you match it with uh, you use a, th a last solvent that has the same refractive index than proteins, and then it becomes transparent. And then you, so you do immunostaining on your whole organ, a whole embryo. It could be also an adult organ. Then you clear it after the immuno, and then you image with light sheet microscopy. So. so, so Yeah, actually microscopy, and then you can go to three centimeters or three uh, cube centimeters more or less at, at this point. Okay. Uh, one more question. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you very much, Mans. That's fantastic.